In a remote area of the Hoenn region, there is said to be an incredibly reclusive chef with nearly inhuman abilities. Deep in the mountains, he works tirelessly on his craft where he has strengthened both his body and mind. But on incredibly rare occasions, he will venture out to the seaside Lily Cove City in order to spend the day blending pokey blocks at the contest hall. He is the best in the business. He is the one and only Blend Master. The Master will only appear in Pokemon Emerald, but his appearance solves a minor but strange difficulty issue that has only become more present in these games with their aging. And we're going to dive into it today as we take a quick trip to the Hoenn region and explore one of Pokemon's most elusive yet still incredibly useful NPCs as we make some Pokeblocks and hang with the best of them. This is the story of the Blend Master. I want to start with some background for the situation before the master makes his grand appearance. Uh? We've got to spin the tail for his arrival all the way back at the beginning. Wait, not that far back. Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, please. All right, great. The third generation of Pokemon finally dared to ask the age-old question, what was he cooking? With a complete overhaul to the berries that were introduced in Gen 2, the number of effects that a berry could have when held during a battle was greatly expanded, and there was even a set of berries with the purpose of making competitive team building easier by allowing you to remove effort values from your Pokemon and making optimizing them an easier process. All of this was fantastic, baseline changes for Pokemon at large, really upping the complexity of the games and adding quality of life features. But that was really just the business side of things, the surface even. This berry overhaul brought with it an entirely new game mode that berries played a role in, totally different from anything Pokemon had tried before, the Pokemon contests. For me, this was brave and new and awesome territory for the games. These contests felt very expansive and almost intimidating in a way because of it. Contests have you use moves and compete kind of like normal, but you're instead aiming to impress the judges and earn the highest score rather than eliminate your foes. The wildest thing to me was how in-depth it all was. Every move has a contest effect. There are five unique contest categories and different attributes of appeal. Smartness, cuteness, toughness, coolness, and beauty -ness. You get me. Any individual contest is a competition in which Pokemon best exudes one of those five traits. And then there's different tiers for each of those categories, all with accolades and rewards to earn. You need to make sure you're using the right style of moves, playing to hype up the audience, all while the other Pokemon are trying to sabotage you. This is shocking complexity for what could ultimately be described as a side mode or just another mini game. Now Drew, that's fantastic. It sounds like a really special time in your life. But what does any of this have to do with the Blend Master or this problem that you claim he solves? I can hear you asking. The main complexity to these contests was in the moves. That was the main event, but you couldn't really pull ahead of the competition without doing well at the condition judging. A Pokemon's condition, it's judged for its stats in those five categories I mentioned earlier, depending on the contest it's in. And this is where the cooking comes in. Contest stats are raised by Pokeblocks, which you can make by using berries at the blending stations, which are found at the various contest holes. Berries have five possible tastes that each correlate to a contest stat. If you eat that type of Pokeblock, it will raise that stat. But it's my experience that Pokeblocks, and resultantly the contests, are something that is easy to get into but much harder to really excel at. The game itself is simple. You toss berries in the blender, and when the spinning arrow points at your name, you press A. The strength and the qualities of the Pokeblock that are created are based on how well you did at the game and the power of the berries put inside. Berries each have their own individual stats that dictate their power level. You feed them to the Pokemon, and then the respective stats go up. It's a functional process, but time has created a strange difficulty curve for this entire ordeal. And that's because making good Pokeblocks is by default a multiplayer outing. There are in-game NPCs you can group up with too, but they are for the most part mediocre at blending and are limited to contributing very basic berries. These NPCs serve to enable the process at all for the dedicated solo player, but they're mostly going to serve to make just passable Pokeblocks through the course of usual gameplay. But alternatively, if you could get together with some friends in person, you would be able to make much better Pokeblocks as long as you were all decent at the game and at least contributing some decent berries. If everyone's pulling their weight, this is going to level up your average Pokeblock across the board. And on top of all of this, more players results in better Pokeblocks. So if you could get three other people together, well folks, we are in business. Maybe that was a reasonable ask when the games came out. That was years ago. Ruby, Sapphire, and especially Emerald are not cheap or easy games to get a hold of these days. And then you need the materials for multiplayer. 
So one way to ensure I can get my high spec Pokemon snacks is either buying everything or finding people who can contribute to the setup with their own Pokemon and Game Boys. And you know, when I say it all out loud like that, it sounds pretty silly. So let's go back to the in-game NPCs. Let's make the best out of these characters. You know, if I can get a hold of some of the more powerful in-game berries, we should still be able to make something decent. That's totally true, but I'm probably going to spend a ton of time doing that. I'd even dare say an unreasonable amount of time, depending on the berries that we want. The majority of the high-level berries require you to at least beat the game. From there, you can start to access the high-tier Pokeblocks by telling some secret passwords to the Berry Master's wife, who can give you one of the most powerful berries in each flavor category. So that's something. But I don't love these because there's no indicator in the game that she has them at all. Now it is probably a bit of a giveaway that she's asking for a phrase like this, so you can probably guess that there's something going on under the hood. But as far as I know, these passwords were found on guides and online, and no one in-game is explaining this, so they're a little out of the way for me. And I wanted to challenge myself to see if I could figure this out without using the internet, you know, just to make a point. And folks, I'm completely stumped. I have looked at the Prima and Nintendo Power guides for Emerald, and the Prima and Brady Games guides for Ruby and Sapphire, and I was only able to find one out of the five passwords in the Nintendo Power Emerald guide. But somehow, these passwords got onto the internet, and now every related website and forum has them written down. Where did this information originally come from? There might be a guide I missed or something I didn't see, but the information wasn't in the item index or in the section about the Berry Master in any of the guides except for the one that I mentioned, and it should really be right there in all cases. If you know the original source for these passwords, please let me know down below. I just can't seem to figure it out. Going from there, we have a short list of berries that are not available on the Game Boy Advance itself, but can be traded in from the GameCube titles. This is absurd for its own reasons, but at least they exist. So that's another ridiculous, but technically available option. And then finally, we have the lychee berry, which is found on the in-game Mirage Island. This is another one which really requires its own guide. Yeah, go figure. So go watch one of those and I'll try to be brief. Every day, the game generates a number, one out of 65,536. And if you have a Pokemon in your party with a matching personality value, the island is spawned in. And this is an effect for all six of your party members, so you can get it down to one in 10,923. But that's still pretty rare for one single berry. Now there is the easy way that involves RNG manipulating off of a new save with a dead battery. This is definitely an option if you've got the resources for it. RNG manipulation stuff feels a little bit over my head, but I'm sure I could figure it out. So there are some in-game options, but these methods all have their own costs to get the berries to overcome the basic NPCs. And so we've got this fork in the road. The material price presented by trying to get the multiplayer set up together in the current day, or the money, skills, or time required of going for the powerful berries in single player. And there's definitely some overlap between those two. If only there was another way. Someone who could do it all. Circumvent these incredible barriers. If only there was some sort of... Master. A blend master. Yes! The Blend Master! He will descend from the mountains to the contest hall and make blending easy for everyone. He's perfect at the minigame. He only contributes high quality ingredients. Every pokey block we make is laced with gold. We have waited, and here he is. The Blend Master only contributes high tier berries based on the berry you contribute, where he will try to match the flavor of your berry. Even better, his match does not change across sessions, making it very easy to generate several near identical high level Pokeblocks. For example, if I toss in an Orin Berry, he will always toss in a Pam Tree Berry, despite the Orin Berry having a tie for its most prominent flavor. He has a pool of 5 berries that he normally pulls from, and a secondary pool if you use a berry from his first pool. This makes him not only extremely valuable for the aspiring blender, but incredibly reliable on top of that. So the Blend Master is the best of both worlds for the dichotomy I was talking about earlier. He appears as an in-game NPC, so you can do the high-level blending all by yourself. No need for any multiplayer activity with multiple games. And the window for entry is significantly lower. Berries found on the first few routes get paired with his ultra-powerful ones, so as soon as you get him, you've got it made. Okay, but then, how do you get him? The Blend Master is one of four random events that is announced on TVs around the region. If you check a TV and the screen is flashing, there will be a news update for one of the four events to be happening soon. These TV announcements are only seemingly random though. Every time you leave most wild battles or trainer battles, with some exceptions, the game rolls a number between 0 and 65,535, and if that roll is below 655, one of the four events will be randomly selected. So that's about a 1% chance for the 1 in 4 on top if you're going specifically for the Blend Master. 
Unfortunately, the game does not let you know if you got a hit for the events until the day after, where the TVs will start announcing that the selected event will be showing up soon. When the event actually happens, it will last for the day, so you gotta act fast. That's the bullet points on the TV events in Gen 3. If you want to know more about the intricacies, Sir Toasty Toes has a great video that goes very in-depth on the subject with a focus on the department store event that I think is really worth a watch. And yes, famously, since time is involved, this all requires the in-game clock to function to get any of it off the ground. But anyways, I feel like that sounds like a lot just to get these events to spawn in, but it's really not that bad. It's just playing the game as usual. Now, like I said, exceptions apply, but doing random encounters and battling trainers is just playing Pokemon. So if you like Pokemon enough to spend hours molding about things like high-level Pokeblocks like I do, then you're probably going to do those things. It's something that you would do even if I wasn't telling you to do it right now. Which I am, I guess, in a weird way. But that's the beauty of this entire saga. It's the beauty of the contrivance of this entire situation. We've got these two issues in making the high-level Pokeblocks, either an intense grind for in-game resources or the problems that come with multiplayer. Both of these are valid options, and they serve as great alternatives for each other. Go it alone and grind at the top, or get together with some friends. But a solution is presented to both of them in the Blend Master. You can get the best of both worlds. Everything you need to do to blend at a high level is enabled by him, and the only thing that you need to do to get the event to spawn in is just play the game you're hopefully already enjoying. So mechanically, this strikes me as a great inclusion. Even right when the games came out, it was relief for people who didn't have the time or know-how to get the high-level berries. And it was relief for people without the means to do multiplayer to make things easier. Even more so now, multiplayer is even further difficult, so this mechanic even does a little bit of future-proofing. And while I would say it does have the weakness of not really being made known to the player until it spawns in, the method of spawning is so simple and natural. The event is eventually going to happen either way, and it may be be just the thing that gets someone to go engage with the contest to begin with. It's presented as this whole special event that you need to make it down there for the day. All in all, this might seem very insignificant, this whole problem that I'm presenting, and on paper, I agree. It's a very minor problem, an insignificant one. Contests are flexible enough where you don't desperately need high condition stats if you have some expert know-how, and that level is even further lowered by the low-grade Pokeblocks you can get very easily. But consider with me the ideas and the design flow at play here. Just humor me for a little bit. Early Pokemon is plagued with larger issues like these, gameplay functionality that is locked away behind multiplayer aspects, or absurd amounts of grind time, or sometimes even real-world money contrive barriers to entry that make certain things absurdly difficult or sometimes borderline impossible to experience as they originally were. Look at the multiplayer minigames in Fire Red and Leaf Green. These minigames, while minor, are hard locked behind the specific wireless adapters and a hard requirement of multiple games and systems. Especially with modern prices, it's an extreme hassle. Some players are never going to get to do it for themselves. Continuing down the road, look at the Wi-Fi plaza in Platinum. I can't go there anymore because that Wi-Fi service was shut down. This entire area of the game that, in its original inception, is truly lost to me. Pokemon has decided to close the area for good. The Gen 5 games, and their original vision, have lost such major pieces of their identity. Content in and out of game that wasn't future-proofed in any way. As we knew them, they are totally gone. Even something extremely recent like the Dynamax adventures in Pokemon Sword and Shield's DLC area. If the service goes down, how am I ever going to approach something like the extremely difficult Zygarde raids with the just barely functioning NPC teammates? But what if there was a Blend Master, or something like it, for these defunct features? A freebie that the game is willing to throw at you because it knows that everyone doesn't have access to grind time, extra peripherals, a social group, or just that people aren't playing the game right when it comes out. An NPC or a rare item that circumvents contrived windows of entry for a feature. You know, with modern measures, a final patch to a game could be some method of unlocking those elements. I think it would do a ton for the overall experience. A failsafe for those people who want to be able to make those memories. And so while, yeah, the specifics of this Blend Master problem are incredibly minute, to me, it's an emblem of peak game design that is focused around the timelessness and availability of memories and experiences. And maybe that lens timeless experiences is part of what covering and playing these old Pokemon games is all about. I hope we can keep making them. That's all I got for you folks. Drimish out.